Well, this is either gonna be the longest 18 minutes of my life or the shortest. So, and I'm also handicapped. I only have three quarters of a thumb, so that's gonna be really hard to do this with. So that's my elephant, and it's a none too subtle jab. So, for the better part of the last two decades, the stories behind me, the ones that you've been hearing about for the last couple of years, I, I've been dealing with these for a little bit longer. This stuff has been the soundtrack of my career. So in that time, nearly 20 years, I'm pretty sure that I've been considered a Cassandra when I worked for Uncle Sam, and now that I'm in the private sector, I guess I'm considered a little bit of a visionary. I know. So I'm not sure if I've either arrived or like you've all caught up. <laughs> so I think I'm moving on. So I've been watching this train wreck. Well, I've been watching this train wreck for most of my professional career. I've been in computer security long enough to remember when hacker wasn't a pejorative and that they didn't like prepend the word cyber to everything from sex to warfare. So for a long time, I promised myself that I, if I ever had this forum, I would rock it. I would give you the talk of your lives on technical espionage. I was gonna tell you, you know, motivations, actors, countries involved, the stakes, you name it. It was gonna be awesome. Then Mike told me, I have 18 minutes. <laughs> so instead of that talk, you're basically getting this one. We're advanced a little bit further. Here's what I wanna say. Finally, you've been hearing about this stuff, the stuff that I've known about for 20 years, the last two years you know about it. It's pretty clear that the White House knows about it because they not only demand, but they've actually urged China <laughs> to stop hacking us. I have it on good authority that the next step is a strongly worded letter. <laughs> so, so, just moving on here. One of the things that I'd want to talk to you about is the targets involved with who, who is like China going after? What you have here is a chart courtesy of the New York Times. I don't, please don't blame me for this. This is, this is their art department. But I do, I do want to show you some stuff on this. Every one of these is an industry vertical that is suffering serious attacks. You know, if you were to ask me who they are, I think my flippant answer to you would be everyone. And the more nuanced answer would be like, you know, more nuanced. So in the beginning, in the mid-90s, what they did was Chinese companies, uh, the People's Liberation Army, targeted our large defense companies. And the military, and to a degree the three-letter government agencies, over time, that kind of shifted and changed to those plus high-tech industries, and then really oddly enough, law firms. And I'm gonna explain the law firms reference in a bit with an old Russian hacking adage. So, I, I know, they actually have them. So in, in 2003, this morphed into this free-for-all, the free-for-all you see. So everything today is fair game. What, I, what you see here, loading from left to right, top to bottom, these are some name brand companies. Ooh, there's one that actually sponsored TEDx Midwest. And another one. What you have here, what I'd like you to look at, are the superlatives. You've got the world's biggest defense contractor. You have the world's largest search engine. You have the world's largest provider of software. World's largest provider of microtrips. World's largest social networking site. Highest market cap. Superlatives. Everything's fair game. Everything. Those you saw there, less than 5%. I know that there are more than 500 other companies that I can't tell you about. I can't tell them about it because we reverse engineer command and control systems and find these targets. I can't tell them. I, said, I can't solicit work. I mean, forget it, like that would be uh, uh, very unethical. That should sink in a little bit. All those superlatives are, pick the cliche, tip of the iceberg, you name it. China does this for a reason. We would have to kind of wonder why. 
There's so much effort involved. They have done remarkable things. They've lifted 400 million people out of poverty in the last 20 years. They've expended tremendous effort and energy to build their economy. They've <laughs> expended a tremendous energy into espionage, though. And I'm going to give you, in like keeping with the kind of TED fascination with three things, I'm going to give you the three main reasons, I think, that they're doing it. China is in a race. This data, and by the way, I need to you know, talk about this data, right? Um, this is supplied by a statistics type from the People's, Repu the People's you know, Republic of China. What you see here, this hockey stick, there's just one little mark on it that's actually a little bit incorrect. They forgot an event over here that you might recognize that actually really did sort of lift them, give them impetus to reform their economy much faster. Um, I don't dispute anything other, on this chart, uh, but other than saying this, the PRC is in a race at that level of expectation. No economy grows that way. So I'm going to touch on why it's happening, and you're going to eventually, when I tell you this, you're going to learn how to avoid getting screwed with your pants on if you do work in the PRC, or if you're in a, a business on that last set of slide. Reason number one. Elevated expectations. Okay? So. Demographics. So if you want to know what scares the living sh uh, stuff out of me, there's a demographic time bomb ticking in China. There are so many terrifying facts around this topic I'm just going to stick to three of them. Again, there's that three thing. There's this upcoming retirement bubble. There's the potential consequences involved with a cohort of what they call bare branches. These are men who have no chance of getting married. By 2040, there will be more single men in China between the ages of 18 and 36 than live in the entire state of Texas. It's actually never happened before. Wage inflation. China's wages are going up by double digits. So I have to actually stop on the demographics thing. This topic would need a dozen talks of this length to address. It is terrifying. They're in a race, China, to shift their economy from manufacturing and export to internal consumption, one weighted appropriately between manufacturing and services, not all manufacturing and export. In order to win this part of the race that they're in, they need all their indigenous innovation, and they need ours. And that's why they do what they do. That's reason number two. This one is really bad. So it's human nature when faced with an insurmountable horror. Like, you're either going to react by shutting down, or you're going to react by trying to do humor. This is my attempt at humor. Beijing on a good day is like, I'm, you know, is comparable to Mordor on a bad day. <laughs> Listen, this is one, my, one of my ideas worth sharing. China's economy is a Ponzi scheme. It burns the environment as their capital. That needs to be heard. They're in a race to change this fast, and I don't think they have the slightest clue. And that's reason number three that they're in a race. So, Mike asked me to scare you guys a little. I have to scare you, this is my job. When I was first asked to do this, one of the, one of the organizers of the conference said, has anyone ever died from a hacking incident? And uh, I actually didn't hesitate. I was like, yeah, sure, yeah, maybe, <laughs> kind of. So proximate cause, you know, causality in facts, proximate, litigators in the room, litigators, no? Anyway. Um, what I'm going to give you right now is a little bit of reasoning that sort of follows for want of a nail, the horseshoe was lost, for want of the horseshoe, the horse was lost, etc. But first, <laughs> how bad could it possibly be? This was Mike's question to me. How bad could it possibly be? So what I'd like to do is talk about a creature that escaped the lab in China. 
We're going to present a talk, a conversation that's in the congressional record between Don and Jerry. But first, a word from our sponsor. So I'm not a lawyer. This last line, post hoc ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore, because of this, take what I say to you, you know, at that, and these are my views, please don't sue anybody, whatever. <laughs> this is the conversation. They say never read the slide to a savvy audience. I'm gonna break that rule right now. MISO, Midwestern System Operating Authority. Jerry Snickney is an operator at a power plant in Ohio called First Energy. This conversation was recorded on August 14th, 2003. I want to just direct you to, before, before time passes, Jerry, we have no clue our computer is giving us fits too. We don't even know the status of some of the stuff around here. About 10 minutes passes. The MISO operator calls. I called you guys like 10 minutes ago. I thought you were figuring out what was going on. Well, we're trying to. Our computer is not happy. It's not cooperating either. That's in the congressional record, August 14th, 2003. How many people in this room know what happened August 13th, 2003? Anybody? Nobody? The blackout on the East Coast. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. If you read the congressional report, it pretty much states in very weaselly language that certain energy management systems were not affected by Blaster, MS Blaster, the worm that attacked Microsoft computers at that time. But it never mentioned that alarm systems weren't affected. Without an alarm system, you get things like, we have no clue. It's not cooperating. You got an alarm system going up and down like crazy. You got energy operators that don't have insight into their networks. You've got a worm running around the internet that, by the way, was written in China. By the way, how bad could it be? People died. People died during that blackout. That's how bad it could be. <laughs> there. That was my, I, 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 had to, I had to scare you, so I'm sorry. Mike, am I OK? OK. I'm going to go back to targets. This is my Russian adage. It talks about how the Chinese target and, and get to senior executives in our business and our intelligence agencies and our military. The most telling aspect, you cannot scale hacking for the, you can't scale it because it's based on the talent of individuals and people. In order to scale it, well, let me go back to the adage. Everybody gets this. You never attack the powerful person. You attack the powerful person's people. So here's where the adage comes from. In order to be effective, powerful people need a powerful number of assistants. Ask yourself, if you needed to learn everything you could about a target, a powerful business person, wouldn't it be great to have their lawyers mail school? And it's not just lawyers, right? So it's accountants, financial advisors, therapists, paramours. I was actually going to say mistresses, but we're so modern here that I figured we have to, you know, gender appropriate. The primary attack vector used by the Chinese today is this exact thing. They find out who you are. They find out who your assistant is. They get a spoofed email from you to your assistant, and that's how it works. Mike wanted specific advances, so I, I asked my lawyer, right? He literally had an aneurysm. I hate when people use literally and figuratively wrong. My lawyer literally had an aneurysm. I was bright enough to take that as a no. You don't get examples. But I will tell you this. My eldest daughter has received spear phishing emails from the People's Liberation Army with zero-day PDF files embedded in them because they desperately want to be in my network. And my eldest child has an internet presence. I don't have a very big internet presence. So that's real. Methods. This is it. Spear phishing. Far and away, the most effective vector. The term probably needs some explanation, right? A spear phishing attack is a targeted attack that comes from a perfected imposter. We have three classes. Strangers, imposters, perfected imposters. So for the sake of this talk, strangers, they can be ignored. They're like the canonical Nigerian oil minister looking for venture capital. 
You can just ignore that one. An imposter is what you get when your maiden aunt gets her AOL account popped and she starts sending you email about being stuck in London with no suitcases and desperate need of a few grand. By and large, imposters, you can find them by like voice or tone, right? I've had clients explain to me like various phishing messages that they, they just don't sound right, right? So it doesn't sound right. It's also like super unlikely that your maiden aunt is in London, all that stuff. So, right. So the final case is the perfected imposter. And this is the type of targeted attack used by the PLA. It's the way they scale their espionage, right, to the size they are today. All it requires, and this is key, it doesn't require elite hacking skills, right? You get some elite hackers, they make you zero day vulnerabilities, then you get a group of people that can do this. All they need is an idiomatic understanding of the language of the victim, right? And you're halfway there. So, I'm supposed to leave you with something uplifting, you know, to give you options, like to help you understand where you can go and, and what you can do about this. So, I would say this. At my company, we periodically test the resilience of our clients' ability to withstand sophisticated phishing attacks. And we have, we're a very large company, and we, we do a lot of big gigs. Not one of our clients has ever passed. So, not one, which is sad. So, not doing work in China or limiting connectivity to the rest of the world electronically is clearly not an option, right? I know, I know. So what can someone do? So it turns out you can actually do a lot. So the muscle memory stuff, the axiomatically true stuff, right? You know this since you were a kid, the common sense, Fronos, this is what you do. You don't talk to the guy in the white panel van, right? No one does that, no one does that. You'd never piss in the well. That one transcends all cultures. You know in some cultures, it's okay to talk to strangers. In some cultures, it's perfectly okay to take food from a stranger. In no culture is it okay to piss in the well. Do not do that. There is no royal family in Nigeria. That's it. There are certain neighborhoods you should not be in. And if your prospective partner in China needs your code or your design documents, they need your Verilog, find another ch partner. China is big. I have a talk coming up tomorrow on three things that you can seriously do to limit your effective you know, vulnerability in the People's Republic of China. If you're going to be around, I invite you to come to that talk. And if you'd like to ask me any questions, I'm going to be here today. So thank you very, very much.